I'm Glenn Campbell. I call myself a demographic philosopher. I'm looking at life and trying to predict the future through the lens of demography or the study of human populations. Uh, a couple of days ago, I saw a two-hour documentary uh, while flying from Denver to Atlanta called Spaceship Earth about the Biosphere 2 project in the 1990s where eight people were locked into a closed system in Arizona. They were locked into this utopian uh, sort of spaceship in the Arizona desert to spend uh, two years without any air or food uh, coming into this system. So they were essentially, this was an experiment in, in a interstellar spacecraft, you could say, uh, it just never left the ground. It, it's this very impressive uh, architectural uh, marvel uh, north of Tucson. I've actually visited the Biosphere 2 uh, as a tourist. About 2009 is when I visited, when it was already turned over to other parties. Um, but this documentary uh, described the project from the point of the view of the participants of the bionauts who took part in it and uh, and the people who organized it at the time i just thought of it as a uh, a rich man's vanity project the rich man being ed bass a, a billionaire who funded this project but i see from the documentary there's also a rich human story here and the reason i want to bring this up and discuss it in this podcast is that uh it applies in some ways to my uh, proposed project, uh, the post-nuclear family, where you would take eight people, eight adults, and uh, in effect put them on a, a spaceship to raise a family together. And I want to compare and contrast the two systems, and perhaps the Biosphere 2 can give us some insight into... Uh, into how my system might work or might fail uh, because obviously the the biosphere system failed uh the, the to cut to the chase they were supposed to lock themselves into this um, closed system for two years without any air without any air being injected from the outside without any food from the outside they would raise their own food they would produce their own oxygen by all the uh, plants they had in there with them the project was seen as a failure because eventually they they had to add oxygen to this system. It was not a closed system. The carbon dioxide just kept building up, and eventually they had to inject oxygen into it. And sooner or later, the whole project collapsed. It became a it became a cultural joke, and uh, eventually the original plan was was aborted, and it just. Uh, now devoted to conventional research. Um, I found my own visit to be very uh, fascinating. I, I have lots of photos, and if you look at the uh, uh, the YouTube version of this podcast, in the description I have links to my own photos of Biosphere 2, which is a fascinating visual place, uh, and links to a lot of other things. Uh, this is a podcast that I'm not scripting. Most of my podcasts I uh, write out before I do. This one I'm just flying by the seat of my pants. Uh, so you should also look at the YouTube description uh, for any corrections I may have about this, uh, uh, about Biosphere 2, any mistakes I may have made. There's all sorts of uh, ways you can say why it failed. I mean, uh, you, you can talk endlessly about why it failed. It, it was a big showy project, uh, a very expensive $200 million, I think, to build this essentially a giant greenhouse. Uh, and with many different biomes, it had a desert, it had a rainforest. And it was, it was obviously for show. And all, they had all their eggs in one basket in this essentially one project. Uh, you could have taken a $200 million and, and distributed over a lot of little projects that would have accomplished a lot more scientifically. 
but this was a big extravagant showy project and it, it's obvious kind of obvious from the beginning that it would fail that's how i felt in 1991 when i read the news stories that this thing is is going to fail in some way um but the documentary put it all in a different perspective for me uh, i now see the human story of the of the things that led up to this project it's not just a rich man's project it's uh, a lot of a lot of little people a lot of smaller people who were engaged in this um it it was born basically in a a commune in the 1960s the group co cohered around this one charismatic leader and one of their first projects was to start a uh, a commune essentially in the desert of new mexico and from there their projects just grew bigger and bigger and bigger at some point they hooked up with this ed bass the an oil billionaire um, uh, from a rich texas family and he funded their expeditions their next expedition after the uh the farm the communal farm was a to build a boat they built a ship themselves obviously funded by somebody probably by ed bass and they they sailed around the world uh, in this sailing ship and engaged in all sorts of profit making projects uh, one that comes to mind is a uh, they built designed and built a a hotel in tibet or was it uh in the himalayas i can't from it could have been nepal um and uh so they were not uh it was it wasn't entirely socialist it was a capitalist endeavor to to go around the world and, and, and engage in these innovative businesses they learned how to do, execute big projects and eventually it grew into this biosphere giant biosphere project and of course it failed and everybody went their separate ways um and it, it, it's just a, it was very amusing to to hear each individual story of the bionauts and the people who organized this thing obviously many people chose not to participate there's no interviews with ed bass himself some of the bionauts apparently didn't participate but it's still a riveting story and I'm kind of glad that I was trapped on this flight, this two-hour flight, where I just had just enough time to see this documentary. So how does this compare to my proposed system? My proposed system, as discussed in other podcasts, is called the post-nuclear family. And I'm trying to address a demographic issue uh, in that mankind uh the, the developed world does not seem to be able to produce enough babies and it's obviously because for individual parents babies are not a profit making enterprise it's 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 very expensive very risky to raise a child in the modern world and um, my proposal is to uh, distribute the risk by having uh a number of adults join forces to raise children together. And, and my initial group of adults would be maybe eight adults, maybe four couples, eight adults, which is a lot like the eight bionauts who entered Biosphere 2. Uh, and I want to compare how my system, uh, which hopefully would succeed, uh, compares to this biosphere system, uh, which obviously failed. And I think the biosphere failed uh, because it tried to do too much. It tried, tried to do everything all at once. Instead of doing a lot of little experiments that would have added up to some scientific progress, they chose to focus on a single big massive showy project where they tried to do everything uh they they assembled everything of earth in this uh in this under this dome and uh we went around the earth to decide what they what sort of plants and animals they're going to bring into their 
their system. And it was just too big. It had to fail. If it wasn't carbon dioxide, it would have been something else. Uh, so that's the first lesson uh, I would apply to my system is don't make it too big. Don't try to do too many things at once because if you do, it, it's just going to be uh, it's just going to be too heavy. It's going to be too big, and some part of the system. If the system is too complex, then some part of the system is going to fail. And in my project, I'm just making little baby steps. You know, right now we have what what is called the nuclear family, where a man and a woman, or two men and two women get together romantically and decide to raise kids. Uh, and they raise one kid, maybe they raise two kids, but at that point you're pretty exhausted. And, and most, the vast majority of families these days don't go on to three or four or five kids. And so these pe few people who do produce babies, they're not producing enough of them. So my first step would simply to be, instead of four couples raising their children separately, maybe these four couples should join forces and raise their children together in one house. And my whole system kind of flows from that one concept, because once you decide to do that, it raises all sorts of questions and, uh, I have to answer those questions as best I can. Um, how are you going to organize these eight people? And how are you going to keep these eight people from killing each other? Which the Bionauts were on the verge of doing at some point during their two-year project. Uh, as carbon dioxide built up in, in, in the environment, so too did tensions among the, the crew members where uh, they wanted to to strangle each other and strangle their handlers in the outside world. So how do you prevent that? Uh, first of all, these eight people would be cooperating on this one project, but not necessarily anything else. What my project holds the promise of is that you can be a parent one day a week instead of eight days a week. When you have eight adults and can distribute the responsibilities among eight adults, then in theory, one adult can be on duty in the family uh, on any one day, and the rest can go off and do whatever they want. And I'm not imposing any restrictions on what these other people do in their private lives. It's a lot like uh, a community church where people come in for Sunday services or whatever, or community events and they all participate in the upkeep of the church. But when they're not in church and not participating in community events, they're off doing their own thing. They're pursuing their own careers. Uh, they have their own private and personal lives that does not have to mingle with the lives of the other adults, which is a great contrast between with the Biospherians the Biospherians were, were trapped with each other. They couldn't escape from each other. And in my system, I propose that there is an escape as, as long as you, you perform your duties in the family, which might be 20% of your life, 10 or 20% of your life. The rest of your life can be devoted to anything you want without any restrictions. You can have any relationships you want. You don't have to spend all your time with the other uh, participants, the other adult participants. Maybe in this group of eight people, there are couples who choose to live with each other, uh, choose to be married to each other, but you don't have to be. People can get divorced uh, from each other and still support the family. So that's my number one lesson of Biosphere 2 is don't make it too big. Whatever utopian thing, whatever utopian plan you have, you got to ease into it step by step. You can't do too much at once. You can't 
you can't take on wholesale changes to your life. You can only take on small changes. Small changes can add up over time, and this system 50 years after it starts could be radically different from how this thing started, but you have to ease into it. There has to be a gradual evolution into this new way of, of life. One of the ways that Biosphere 2 failed is that it tried to find solutions for all of humanity. It, it, it tried to be a model of sustainability for all of humanity. And I don't think that the post-nuclear project should try to do that, try to solve the problems. The, the world has huge demographic issues. Um, we, we're facing economic and, uh, and political ruin uh, because of our demographics. And it's not the job of any one family to fix society. Uh, one family should only try to achieve its own goals and fix its own, own society. Uh, and, and the reason you would want to participate in a family like this is because it served your own needs, your own need to build something for the next generation and pass your wisdom on to the next generation. It has nothing to do with trying to save the social security system or save your country. You're trying to save yourself and the community you belong to, you feel that you belong to. And uh, that's the only reason to engage in this project. And if, if you don't feel strongly enough about it, about saving uh, some of yourself for the next generation, then you simply don't participate. Uh, this has to be a self-motivated project. It has to be a self-funded project because we don't, we can't count on an Ed Bass being able to fund this thing for us. We have to fund it ourselves. So when these eight people get together and decide we want to raise our children together, that should be all you need. You don't need any government support. You don't need any permission from anyone else. You just need to find these seven other people that you're close enough two that you trust enough that you can engage in this project with and that's probably the single most difficult challenge of this project is how to find these other like-minded people who you trust and are willing to essentially engage in a lifelong commitment with you know uh, marriage is a lifelong commitment between two people and the post-nuclear family would be a lifelong commitment between eight people. So there's a huge challenge there. How do you anticipate all of the conflicts you're going to have in the future? Uh, and if you choose good people to start this project with, people who uh, believe in uh, certain principles of conflict resolution, certain principles of how children should be raised, and you, you make a good selection at the beginning, that's probably the most important thing for the success of the project uh, on the long term. If you make bad choices, just like a bad marriage, things can turn horrible uh, very quickly. So if you think finding a good romantic partner is difficult, imagine trying to find seven good partners the only saving grace here is that uh, you don't have to be in perfect sync with your seven partners on everything. You don't have to live with your seven partners. You only have to agree on this one project. You only have to agree on the child rearing project and the, the essential philosophy of child rearing and the essential philosophy of dispute resolution. And other than that, you can go on and lead your own life, uh, develop in your own way, change in your own way, as long as you continue to maintain and support the family. The post-nuclear family should be guided by ideology. There should be a set of principles that you coalesce around, uh, but they should be very simple principles because... The risk is if, if you, you embark on something that's too radical, 
that's too ideological. There's, the risk is that your children, once they grow up, become ad adults, they don't want to do it anymore because it's just too hard. It's just too strict, which has been the demise of many a religious group and a religious cult and the kibbutz system of Israel, for example, which raised children in its own way. But it was just too hard, and the children themselves, once they became adults, didn't want to do it. So whatever your ideology is, it's got to be simple, just like... Uh, uh, there should be like 10 commandments, 10 principles that uh, ch children can recite and, and everybody can look at as guiding, uh, guiding the family, certain principles of fairness and intellectual discipline and things like that that all boil down to about 10 commandments that everyone has to live by and, and that can st stand the test of time even as, as the world changes. Because I see this family as something that should last forever, should ask for hundreds of years. Once you start a post-nuclear family with between 9 and 18 kids, you keep, keep it up. You keep, uh, make sure there's always between 9 and 18 kids. Um, and actually, 9 is my target, uh, is my long-term target. So in the post-nuclear family, it's essentially just a big family like we have today. Uh, there are families with six kids, uh, and that's not too uncommon in, the, in, the human, in human history to have six kids or eight kids. And I'm proposing nine kids, uh, evenly spaced in age from zero to 18, and that do a lot of their own self-care, that, that we have a lot of... Um, uh, internal care where older kids are taking care of younger kids and we have an organizational system that does things like clean house and gets the meals made uh, this is all part of their the family culture that you build over time and you don't want that family culture to just vanish uh, as kids age out so as as a as one kid becomes an adult and leaves the family then you bring in a new baby and you just keep the family going forever, even as uh, as adults, the founding adults age and die. Well, there will be new adults that, that were born in the family. And the ideal is to just keep this thing going like a sort of spaceship. Like Think of it like a an interstellar mission where it takes multiple generations to get to your destination. Well, how would you organize it? And... This is the way I propose organizing it. A funny thing about the Spaceship Earth documentary is it never mentioned children. Not even once did it mention children. So it was all about environmental sustainability and not one word about demographic sustainability. I suspect that the group just figured, you know, every baby is, is, since it was born in the 1960s when we thought there was a population explosion, I think the philosophy is, of the group would have been, you know, just no babies at all. And in fact, in the entire two-hour documentary, I saw only one glimpse, you know, two-second glimpse of two children playing and other than that, it was all adults, 100% adults in this documentary. So although they had obviously given a lot of thought to uh, environmental sustainability, they didn't seem to give any thought to uh, demographic uh, sustainability, which I think is more important in the long run that you have children to take over for you. Of course, if you believe that the human race has no right to exist, uh, that we are just a pox on the planet, uh, then you don't care about having children. But if you do believe that hu humanity is worth something and, and it should be continued, then you have to find a way to do it. You have to find a way to bring new children into the world. Uh, and right now we're focused on the problems of nations, Nations that don't have enough workers have too many old people and not enough workers. 
And I see that problem as really unsolvable because nations can't do anything. Countries can't do anything to encourage or force people to have more children. It's just, you know, if it doesn't make economic sense to people, you can't get them to do it no matter what tax credit you give them or what incentives you give them. It's just not going to work. So I'm not trying to solve the problem of nations. And this family should not try to solve the problem of nations it should just try to solve its own problems, the problems of its eight founding me members who want to preserve something in, uh, into the next generation. One of the things I enjoyed about uh, the Spaceship Earth documentary is it was very subtle. Uh, there was, there's no narration. It's all the story is told by the participants. And there's little uh, details here and there. Uh, for example, when the when the biospherians were locked into their uh, in their into their cocoon on September of uh, 1991, there was a there was great drama, and there was a it was a big press event where they walked into this portal and closed the door. And, and the way the press portrayed it is they just closed the door and, and sealed them in. But of course, the door didn't close just right. <laughs> and we, we see them monkeying with the door, trying to get it to close. And from there on, of course, it just kind of, th things, things were wonderful in the beginning. Uh, it was just, you know, euphoria in the beginning, but then various problems would crop up. Uh, there, of course, there was the the uh, carbon dioxide problem. Uh, too much carbon dioxide building up within the dome, which uh, deprived people of energy. They couldn't run anymore. They can only. Uh, uh, it's like being at a very high altitude. They couldn't exert themselves. There was also a not enough food. They weren't producing, you know, they were growing their own food and they just weren't producing enough of it. And this was further hampered by the, the doctor. Uh, the oldest member of the team was this doctor, 60-year-old doctor, who had some ideas about uh, longevity. Uh, he felt that people could live to be 120 if they just restricted their, ca their caloric intake. And... <laughs> So he personally, he was 60 years old, and he personally planned to live 120, but he did not participate in this documentary because he died of natural causes at the age of 79. So not only was there not enough food, but they were being restricted by their doctor. The doctor was deliberately trying to restrict their uh, caloric intake uh, to prevent, to try to extend their lifespans when they were just trying to survive. So not only did they need to survive and produce enough food, but they had to obey all these dietary restrictions going in. There couldn't be any refined sugar, uh, all sorts of things that they had to had to do because they had all of these it was a project that had to do everything all at once. It had to not only survive, but uh, have this perfect diet. And eventually, you know, as, uh, as carbon dioxide rose and the food supply dwindled, of course, everyone shriveled up, lost weight, and they were snapping at each other until the decision was finally made to introduce new oxygen from the outside and suddenly everyone was re revived again and their spirits came back. So thinking about how the post-nuclear family would fail, what are the equivalents of a carbon dioxide buildup? Well, there could be some one member of the family, of the founding adults who just starts becoming a problem. And this one problem employee, you know, every office encounters them. You, you have some one employee who makes everybody else's life difficult. How do you handle that? And, and uh, that's something you really got to handle on the, on the fly. Uh, but the number one thing is, who do you have going into this biosphere with you? Who are these seven other people 
that's probably the single greatest contributor to the success of the project. Uh, if you've got the right people, then you can overcome any obstacle. If you've got the wrong people, then one or two bad apples can, can utterly destroy the project. Once you have these solid eight founding members, uh, then it should be easier because you are raising your next generation. You are raising the people who are going to replace you. And the whole project of childhood is training them in your philosophy and training them in ways that they can replace you. Uh, you don't have that option going in. You have to select existing adults. But once you have your existing adults, the whole aim, the focus of the project is to raise good children who will carry on in your footsteps. It's a big indoctrination program, as is every family. It is an indoctrination program in your way of life, in your language, in your way of looking at things. Children are like little computers that come out of the womb, ready to be programmed, and childhood is this 18-year project to program them. So you have to have an educational system. You have to have an ideology. And when parents come into this, this uh, household, uh, they are participating in this project. And they're not just caring for the kids uh, because to a large extent, the kids will care for themselves. They are pushing an ideology on these kids. They are uh, teaching lessons to these kids and each of these eight people have different lessons to teach. So let's say the Biosphere 2 uh, had a more ambitious plan where not only would eight people go in and survive, but they would produce children who would survive after them. That, that would be more like what I'm doing, uh, what I'm thinking of. So what would it be like to be a child born into the Biosphere 2 who knew only what this environment that was created for them? I think that's a fascinating story. Uh, imagine being born into Biosphere 2 and, 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 and being able to play in the desert and the rainforest and the ocean inside this uh, closed system and only gradually being learning that there's an outside world. Uh, beyond the biosphere and that you know they would eventually have to interact with it and that that's a good metaphor for childhood in childhood you are creating a uh, an artificial environment for children uh, it's a sort of disneyland for children where where all the morality works uh, all the uh, all the rules really work the whole system really works it's an artificial environment created by the parents to transition their children from a very simple childhood to be, being able to handle all the complexities of the outside world. And this is what childhood is. It's an, an artificial world that you create. And in this case, we have eight people creating this artificial household. I am proposing that the eight founding uh, parents do not live in the household. They live their separate lives in their own homes and apartments and only come into the household for their scheduled duties. And, and part of the reason for this is you want to preserve the kind of Disneyland, the kind of artificial ecosystem within this biodome that is the family. And eventually you're going to teach children how to get by in the outside world but it starts out as an artificial environment. The family is, by its nature, an artificial environment. And by having the parents not live at the household, they don't corrupt the environment with, with their adult activities. Uh, there, are things, there are things that adults do that you don't want children to do. There, there are things that adults are exposed to in the outside world that you don't want children to be exposed to. And uh, the household is, is our sort of biosphere where we, uh, 
where cre we create this artificial environment with its own rules and its own internal culture uh, that you want to try to preserve. So I urge you to uh, check out this documentary. Uh, it was released only last year, 2020, Spaceship Earth. I'm sure you'll find it on all your usual uh, platforms for movies and things. Uh, and, and think about the uh, utopias and how they work and how they don't work. And if you were to build a utopia, how would you do it?